Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, as I was already introduced, my name is uh, Rosa Ock and I was working under the supervision of Dr. Jim Cleaves. And I'd like to tell you a few words about uh, chemical reaction networks used for the exploration of probiotic chemistry. Uh, so the central question for uh, probiotic chemistry is how non-entailed chemical processes, which simply dissipate chemical energy, uh, enable the origins of a uh, highly organized complex structure of uh, um, of chemical processes mixed together to to uh, to bigger um, bigger image of whole probiotic chemistry. Uh, and to answer the question, organic chemistry may be just simply not enough, and there is uh, probably one basic reason for that, uh, and it is that probiotic chem the organic chemistry, the canonical organic chemistry, considers mostly uh, just simple uh, high-yielding uh, steps of, of reactions. We can think about uh, long chemical processes, long chemical pathways of reaction, but um, in, in canonical organic chemistry, we are mostly interested in uh, in log pathways, which are which are composed from um, very simple high yielding steps. While when we are considering big systems in which we have a variety of different compounds and a variety of different interactions between these compounds, uh, this approach can just simply not not work very well. Uh, and more prosaic uh, example, uh, similar to to example of probiotic chemistry. Uh, maybe just cooking. Uh, when we are cooking, uh, we we cannot simply just tell that uh, some compound is uh, the most important for for the taste of uh, our meal. Uh, that some reaction is the the most important that decides about whole um, whole output of uh, of our cooking procedure. Uh, we can talk, for example, about uh, Maillard reaction, uh, which uh, um, explains. Uh, Mm, the the creation of color, flavor, and aroma of of bread, for example, when we are uh, baking, but uh, it is just a quite general term uh, in which we can uh, cannot just um, tell which which compounds and which processes are uh, the most uh, important. And uh, in cooking as well as in probiotic chemistry, um, considering chemistry standing behind uh, all these processes. Uh, isn't very simple because often uh, minor and perhaps transient products can hugely impact whole processes we consider. Uh, and we cannot just think about whole this process uh, as a simple sum of its um, constituent steps. Uh, so the basic thing in which organic chemistry lack for, for the research in, in the field of origins of life is that it is not a convenient tool to consider emergent systems, meaning the systems which uh, which are not which characteristics isn't just a simple sum of characteristics of uh, of its constituents. Uh, so, how can we handle this problem? How how can we handle the problem of probiotic chemistry uh, while we know that organic chemistry may not be enough? And uh, as you already know from the title of my presentation, uh, one way to do that uh, are chemical networks. Uh, so in this approach, when we want to use chemical networks for exploration of probiotic chemistry, uh, we resign from simple A plus B equals C type of chemistry. And instead of that, uh, we are trying to think about uh, um, chemistry, which is taking place uh, in probiotic chemistry on cooking, uh, like we are trying to look for, for it as a whole. Uh, we are trying to take into consideration a huge number of molecules, huge number of compounds, and huge number of interactions is interactions between them. Uh, so that's the basic idea standing behind uh, the uh, the chemical networks. And uh, in our project, uh, we tried to use um, the idea of uh, simulation of uh, uh, um, of uh, chemical networks, which could place on uh, could take place on on the young Earth, uh, to search for probiotically plausible pathways of synthesis of uh, nucleosides. Uh, and to do so, we started from, from um, simulating these, uh, these chemical networks. Uh, to do that, we need a predefined set of chemical rules, which will um, tell our compound, compounds uh, how should they react with each other. Uh, we define such set of rules just writing down um, 
different uh, principles of prebiotic chemistry, uh, which tells us how um, different chemical groups can react and interact with, with each other. Uh, and having this set of rules, uh, we need to um, choose some initial substrates to, to start our uh, network. Um, in, in our case, uh, it was urea and acrolein. Uh, and having these compounds, we just apply uh, this predefined set of rules on them, uh, which basically just tells them how they should interact with each other. Uh, and we iterate this operation. We repeat it uh, a given number of times. Uh, and in, in output, we receive a given number of, of generations of molecules, uh, which correspond to the to the number of iteration we uh, we did. Uh, so when we, for example, apply our set of rules on uh, on the initial set of mo of molecules, which mm, in our case consisted from uh, urea and acrolein, uh, we received some bigger uh, set of molecules in uh, in which we had mm, compounds which are products of of these reactions. We applied this uh, set of rules once again on this new set of molecules and we repeat this procedure a few, few times uh, obtaining uh, a list of molecules um, and list of uh, reactions uh, describing their their interactions just interactions between them um, and having that we just had our uh, our chemical our chemical networks um, in which uh, the next step was to uh, locate uh, the molecules we are interested in. In, in this case, uh, it was it, it were nucleosides uh, because we were looking for uh, for the pathways of of their synthesis. Um, so uh, I was interested in four four generations of uh, of such chemical networks, uh, and starting from these two initial compounds, I was able to uh, to simulate it and to obtain um, information about the output molecules and the, the interactions. And having that networks, I did some initial analysis uh, in which I could see which molecules are the most reactive uh, in, in the network uh, and uh, which, uh, um, which reactions are the most popular. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, two uh, measures of, uh, um, of reactiveness, we can say, uh, of these molecules, which are Mm, located in our chemical networks. First of them is uh, in degree, which uh, tells us how many reactions uh, come into the uh, the node, which is our molecule in in the network. So it is chemically it's just basically a uh, a number of reactions which uh, given molecule is uh, is a product of, uh, and uh, we have. Uh, mm, Second, uh, uh, the, the, the second uh, measure, which is uh, out degree, which tells us uh, how many reactions each uh, is our molecule uh, a substrate of. Uh, so having that, we can just say which molecules are, are the most reactive here. Uh, and uh, afterwards, after seeing uh, which molecules are uh, are the most reactive, um, I uh, performed also a Mm, analysis of uh, modularity of uh, of my molecule. Modularity is mm, simply just a measure of uh, being organized into groups uh, in uh, in some network. Uh, so mm, analyzing the, the modularity in in my output network allows me to uh, see how mm, these molecules and reactions are organized into groups, uh, and uh, I could just simply. Mm, see which groups are are the bigger uh, in which regions of my uh, my chemical networks uh, that the molecules are the, the most concentrated in one place, uh, and I could uh, I could tell mm, uh, which which regions are are the, the biggest, and uh, uh, thanks to that I could uh, assign to these regions uh, chemical reactions which were uh, actually taking place in in this uh, region of uh, uh, of chemical network. And that allowed to uh, to tell which uh, chemical reactions were uh, actually the most uh, important, were the most popular in uh, in simulated network. Uh, so the um, the results we can see from here is that 
these four types of, uh, of reaction, uh, Strecker degeneration, uh, transamination, Knobelaga reaction, and uh, Aldo con condensation uh, were the four most popular uh, reactions in um, in my network, which were started from uh, from urea and acrolein. Uh, and the next step uh, to um, complete the um, overarching goal of, of the project uh, is to take a code which will uh, search from this output set of molecules from fourth generation uh, to locate whether we have their uh, molecules which have uh, molecular fragments uh, which we defined um, like before the analysis. So, so the fragment we want to define is a fragment corresponding to uh, analogs and derivatives of purine and uh, pyrimidine uh, nucleosides. Uh, because if we are interested in um, in nucleosides in uh, in general, it is uh, probably smarter to, to consider also the derivatives because from from derivatives is simply we can uh, sometimes get simple way to uh, to get nucleosides themselves uh, themselves. So um, the next step is to um, to look for these uh, derivatives of uh, of nucleosides uh, and uh, just try to follow the um, the pathway, uh, the, the retrosynthesis pathway from uh, from initial substrates, uh, and uh, by um, by doing that, we can uh, we can find uh, a probiotic uh, roof of uh, of synthesis of these molecules. Uh, so I wanted to thank to uh, my supervisor, to Dr. Jim Cleaves, as well to uh, the previous YSPs, uh, which will were very helpful for me, uh, to Romulo Cruz and uh, Sitkan Sharma. Uh, and thank you all for uh, for your attention. I'm uh, happy to to hear your questions now. Wonderful, great job, Rosa. Um, we have some time for questions. If folks want to raise their hands, we can allow that. I do have to say, I I, I love seeing uh, Jim is so good as a YSP mentor of bringing in past YSPs to help mentor the next summer's students as well. And so I always love seeing these acknowledgements to folks from the past years as well. Uh, Sanjoy, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Graham. Rosa, fantastic job. I really enjoyed your presentation. You. I can see that you really worked on the, the coaching advice you got last week and really improved the presentation. So great job. I actually have two questions. Um, one it involves the environmental context of the uh, chemical network. I'm assuming you are running at probably assuming 25 degrees Celsius and pH of seven. Would things diff change if you had warmer or colder temperatures or more acid or alkaline environments? And then the second question is, uh, why did you start with uh, urea and acrolein? OK, so I will start with the first question uh, about the uh, the conditions. Uh, so it is all coded in the set of rules we, uh, we use. What we do in this set of rules is just uh, writing how the uh, different uh, um, chemical groups interact with uh, with each other, uh, and uh, I think it could change uh, when we are changing the temperature, but uh, probably not very significantly. Uh, like certainly, it could uh, um, shift some um, equilibrium when we are thinking about specific reactions. But uh, general rules of organic chemistry, I believe, should be the same uh, in quite um, wide range of temperatures uh, and pH as well. Um, and uh, the second question, why urea and acrolein? Uh, we are just trying different uh, different initial substrates uh, and seeing what is the results from, uh, uh, from each of them. So it is just uh, um, one of the examples we wanted to, uh, to try. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Siddhant Sharma. Yeah, I think I can just start my video and oh hey. Uh exciting talk. I just had had a question on on the thermodynamics of these generated networks. Uh, although I should not be asking this, but uh do you think there's a way to prune these networks so as to get a better representation uh of your outputs? Say you generate, we call them as generations. When you start a generation, you calculate the spontaneity of the network, and then you prune all the values that you don't need. And then those values go in the second generation, and then you repeat that based on the thermodynamic factors. 
and what you get out of five generations is a much more constrained network. Do you think that's a valid, valid approach? Mm, okay, could you, could you repeat actually? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting what you're asking for. Oh, yeah, I think I can, I can repeat that. So mm -hmm. I'm just talking about this, the somewhat dynamic favorability or spontaneity yeah. and non spontaneity. So when you generate a network, you try to prune it up or you try to clean it up by introducing, mm -hmm. like you remove all the ones that are non-spontaneous at first generation, but mm -hmm. feed only the ones that are spontaneous to the next. Yes. Mm -hmm. you do that again for G3, for G4, G5. Mm -hmm. yes, so you, right. when you start at G6, you end up with a very much constrained network that's almost all spontaneous. Do you think that's mm -hmm. a better approach? Uh, I mean, um, it could be a good approach. It's It's... Hard to say because uh, um, sometimes reactions which aren't thermodynamically uh, preferred uh, and uh, are taking place in not very high yield uh, can be also very important in uh, in a network. Can, for example, take part in some autocatalysis cycle or uh, something like that. So uh, it could be a good approach in uh, in some cases, but I believe that in some cases it could also uh, mm, like we could uh, not see uh, some important things taking part in our networks uh, when we are trying to do such simplification. So I think it depends. It's probably worth trying, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure if it could work in uh to, like it could improve uh the network in uh in each case in every case. Sorry. Thanks. That answers my question. Great talk. Yeah, thank you for the question.